Welcome to the Everything History Podcast for episode 23, The Reign of Terror. This is the penultimate episode and climax of my history of the French Revolution. I discharged my last duty as king and emperor. This is Everything History. Everything you hold worthwhile is in sync. We meant more to kids than Jesus did. Or religion at that time. I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Alright, this is an episode that I really wanted to try and knock out of the park. After all, it's the Reign of Terror, one of the most interesting, influential, and despicable times in European history. But I immediately had trouble telling this history, and by the way, that's what I'm really trying to do with this podcast. I'm trying to tell histories. Not really a story, because history isn't just a story or a series of stories. Someday, I might even do an episode on the definition of history, but that would surely be an episode only for the history purists. Anyways, I struggled coming up with this history because it was so important, so dense, and some parts of this terrible time were more complex than others. I usually like to do this by going through the timeline, telling the history as I go, and if something is important, I'll linger on it a little while longer, but I try and stray from jumping around in time because it gets hard to keep up. But with the Reign of Terror, when I tried to do that, it just got really muddy really fast. So, I've decided to divvy up the history of the Reign of Terror. The first section is on the Rebellion, the second on Religious Persecution and Paris Politics, and the third on the Summer Days of 1794. With that explained, let's begin. Last time on the podcast, France once again delved to a new low in their revolution. Pressure by the sans coulant and other extreme revolutionaries led to the arrest of the Girondins, and in September, the government of the Republic was set aside in favor of terror. This was made official when the Constitution of 1793 was suspended in October so France could be run by a government of terror. Now, what is terror in this context? Well, allow me to define the term terror in the context of the French Revolution. Oh, by the way, terror was the word used even by the perpetrators of these horrible atrocities. It wasn't something made up later by historians and writers. Back to the definition of terror. A quick Google search tells me that terror is a very strong feeling of fear. But that is not sufficient in this case. Therefore, in this historical context, I believe terror is best defined by one of its proponents, Robespierre, who said, quote, Terror is nothing other than prompt, severe, inflexible justice. The key word there, of course, being justice. So in the mind of the revolutionaries, that's what terror was meant to be, severe justice. And this actually makes a little bit of sense if you recall Barriere's quotation from last episode that said, quote, Terror is the order of the day. Meaning that the necessary medication to restore France was a swift dosage of violent justice, otherwise known as government sponsored terror, with a capital T. However, while that makes sense, that doesn't make it right, because to the victims, terror was simply murder. How is it justice if the tribunals do not allow court appeals, or in many cases, even defense counsels? That is not justice, that is simply genocide, rationalized by saying, well, the ends justify the means. So, with terror defined, let's begin with section 1, the rebellion. We are only one month into the reign of terror by mid-November, but all prominent opponents in Paris to the mountain and the revolutionaries have already been executed. That meant it was time for terror to expand into the provinces. The best and most drastic example of this occurred in the city of Lyon. As detailed in the previous episode, Lyon had been in open rebellion against Paris since the spring, and the Jacobins had been besieging the city since June. But sadly for the citizens of Lyon, the city had to give in on October 9th. Lyon had did their best to hold out, but hunger and famine finally forced them to surrender to the Jacobin armies. Their surrender could not have come at a worse time, though. The executions in Paris literally started the week of their surrender, and the Jacobins were not going to be merciful to the people of Lyon. As a matter of fact, the people and politicians of Paris were united in their absolute hatred of the Lyonnais. The revolutionaries in Paris wanted the heads of all quote-unquote traitors and rebels, but they wanted to make an example of Lyon, a truly terrifying example. 
and they wanted to make an example of them because Leon had been the largest bastion of traitors and anti-revolutionaries during the early rebellion. So, the Committee of Public Safety declared that the entire city should be raised in the name of liberty. And they were serious. They wanted every building and even mention of the city to be struck from history, quite like the damnation of memory from the ancient Roman Empire. The only mention the committee members wanted left was a plaque among the ruins that was to read, quote, Leon made war on liberty. Leon is no more. But when the command for vengeance reached the commander of the revolutionary forces, a man by the name of Couthon, he and his staff were not so sure. Was such vengeance wise? Was it even necessary? Leon was not Paris's Carthage. It was a French city. Did it and its inhabitants really deserve annihilation? Well, Cthulhu thought not, and set his men on destroying only the richest of dwellings. By November, though, he was replaced by two men ready to exact vengeance and terror. They were De Herbois and Fouché, and the Committee of Public Safety sent units of sans-coulants from Paris to speed the horrible business along. The sans-coulant units began gathering up suspects to be tried for capital punishment for their disloyalty to the Republic. A revolutionary tribunal was also set up, and the convictions began to be decreed. By December, 300 rebels had been sentenced to death, but after the first 50 or so, the guillotines were becoming ineffective, and were only able to take the heads of 20 men and women per day. This was considered far too slow, so the revolutionaries used other methods of execution as well. By December, they were digging open graves and blasting the condemned into them by cannon fire. Within months, almost 2,000 Lyonnais were dead, and each day until mid-spring, the death tolls rose. A German traveler witnessed the events as he passed through in late January of 1794. He wrote, quote, Whole ranges of houses burnt, churches, convents, and all the dwellings of former patricians in ruins. When I came to the guillotine, the blood of those who had been executed a few hours beforehand was still running in the street. End quote. And when the Germans said to the sans coulants that it would be proper to clear away the blood and gore, they responded thusly, quote, Why should it be cleared? It's the blood of aristocrats and rebels. The dogs should lick it up. And after Leon's fall, the situation only deteriorated further for the rebels. But the really awful thing wasn't that they were just leaving territory to the Jacobin Republicans, but the real tragedy was that every defeat the rebels suffered allowed the reign of terror to expand. Yes, just as soon as the rebel cities fell or surrendered, the guillotines and the tribunals rolled in just after to execute justice in the form of terror. But, as I said, after Lyon's fall on the 9th of October, the revolutionary armies continued on the offensive. In southern France, the revolutionary army converged on the strategic port of Toulon. Consequently, the rebels pulled out of the south to defend Toulon as the revolutionary armies of Paris closed in meaning the large urban cities of Marseille and Bordeaux, for example, were given up to the Jacobin armies. The rebels in Toulon could hold out as long as they could stay resupplied by the British from sea, and they did just that until mid-December when an up-and-coming artillery officer arrived on the scene. Captain Napoleon Bonaparte, the future Emperor of France, used artillery fire to force British troops to evacuate Toulon's protecting forts. Without the protection from the local fortifications, the siege was effectively over because the British could no longer safely supply the city with pro-Republican French guns now overlooking the city. Therefore, the evacuation began immediately after Bonaparte's men took the forts and almost 10,000 rebels or counter-revolutionary sympathizers escaped the city on the British vessels before the city was taken by the revolutionaries. Within days, the sans-coulants unleashed terror on the surviving rebels. Over 800 of them were executed by firing squad without even a trial. The Republicans excused this as necessary because the victims were evidently found in the act of armed resistance to the Republic. By February of 1794, another 250 lost their heads in Toulon by guillotine. Elsewhere in the south of France, the reign of terror spread as well. But the terror there was actually much more merciful. The tribunals were set up to dispense justice from Marseille and Bordeaux, but by the summer of 1794, less than 1,000 had been executed by guillotine between the two South France cities. And the acquittal rate was extraordinarily high, hovering around 50%. Now, I realize all of that sounds rather cold, you know, putting it like that, but those numbers are very quote-unquote good, 
compared to the rest of France during the Reign of Terror. Now, in Western France, the situation had progressed far, far differently. I am now speaking of the rebellion in Vendée. Vendée, in this context, refers to the area of Western France near Brittany and south of Normandy. Vendée, after the fall of Lyon, had become the main priority of Paris. The Committee of Public Safety had said exactly that, too. In August, they had declared their intention to destroy Vendée and every rebel along with it. And by late October, the Vendean rebels were on the run, looking for aid from the British. But the British were unable to respond fast enough, and the Republican army destroyed another chunk of the Vendean force at Granville. After this defeat, the Vendeans were routed, and by early December 1793, Vendée was completely overrun by the armies of Paris. On December 12th, though, the two armies met at Le Mans. There at Le Mans, the rebels were annihilated in a wet winter night battle. But the brutality did not stop there, for the Committee of Public Safety ordered all survivors to be hunted down. But General Westerman, the leader of the Revolutionary Army in Vendée, needed no such command. Westerman had already given the order that all rebels caught were to be killed on sight. Sadly, though, what defined a rebel became very broad. A Republican soldier in Westerman's army wrote, quote, The road to Laval is strewn with corpses. Women, priests, monks, and children have all been put to death. We, I, have spared no one. Over 12,000 quote-unquote rebels were massacred in the next two weeks as the Vendean rebels ran in scattered retreat into Brittany. And the last of the royalist rebels were engaged by Westermen at Savigny. But by then their mangled force was a mere 4,000. The Vendeans were crushed decisively and the Republicans gathered the survivors to be slaughtered in mass shootings. It was after this battle that Republican General Westerman wrote back to Paris saying, quote, There is no more Vendee, Republican citizens. It died beneath our free sword with its women and children. I have just buried it in the swamps and the woods of Savigny. Following the orders that you gave me, I have crushed the children beneath our horses' hooves and massacred the women, who will give birth to no more brigands. I do not take a single prisoner. I have exterminated them all. End quote. The rebellion in Vendée was thereafter shattered, and thereby all rebellion during the Reign of Terror was effectively at an end. Yet the violence was just beginning in Vendée and western France as a whole. Because as 1794 began, Paris sent a one General Touro to Vendée. When Touro arrived, he had one of his officers give this order. Quote, Comrades, we are now entering insurgent country. I order you to deliver flames to everything that can be burnt and to bayonet any locals whom you meet on your way. I know there might be a few patriots in this country. Never mind them. We must sacrifice them all. It was then that Touro's infernal columns, as his units became known, entered into Vendée. For months well into April and May, Touro's men ravaged the countryside of Vendée. They burned and destroyed everything in their wake. Whole towns and villages were decimated. Farms and fields were put to the torch, and entire populations executed as if they were animals. Republican soldiers right of their colleagues and brothers-in-arms murdering infants and conducting gang rapes on the regular. Alongside these atrocities, four to 5,000 people were tried and executed as well. Most of them were carried out by guillotine in the city of Nantes. But the revolutionaries came up with another method to murder their countrymen. I speak of the noyades, a term rightfully just as infamous as the guillotine. A noyade was an execution by drowning. The revolutionaries did this by tying their victims to barges and sinking them into the rivers. The bodies often washed ashore later and even polluted local water supplies. Approximately 2,000 died in this manner in Vendée. These horrifying events continued for four months. It is estimated that upwards of 250,000 French people were killed by their own countrymen in Vendée during early 1794. That brings me to Section 2, Religious Persecution and Paris Politics. That requires me to rewind the clock back to the fall of 1793, because as the Republican scourge of terror spread and intensified in the countryside, Paris continued to radicalize. Paris had already executed their king and queen, suspended their own constitution, and initiated terror across their nation, but in November they went further still. They went after the church once more. 
Now, loyal listeners will recall that France experienced a massive move towards de-Christianization during early 1791, but the Paris Commune wanted more still. They wanted to exterminate and wipe out Christianity in their new republic. On November 23rd, the Commune of Paris began this process by closing all churches in the capital and renaming the Notre Dame Cathedral the Temple of Reason. Religious sculptures were removed or destroyed, figures of kings, queens, and saints were destroyed, and any clerical titles were ordered to be struck from the city. Yet, this anti-Christian and anti-clerical posture of the commune and the extremists of Paris was not echoed by everybody. The movement ruffled the feathers of many, especially those from the countryside departments. At first, these voices were simply silenced by the radical anti-clerics, but when the commune tried to extend their decrees to the rest of the nation, it only incited more rebellion. Several members of the Committee of Public Safety even denounced the action. Robespierre himself condemned the early attempts by stating that atheism was aristocratic and believing in a supreme being was a belief of the people. But the radical campaigns for de-Christianization could not be stopped, and by December neither denunciations or open Catholic rebellion could prevent the persecution of anything Christian during the Reign of Terror. Priests, even those who had submitted to the revolution in every way, were forced to give up their titles, vestments, and convictions, lest they be killed. And this violent wave of anti-clericalism continued all the way into May of 1794 as it spread outward from Paris. And I think it would be wise to consider this forced de-Christianization and all the unrest and violence it caused to be very much part of the Reign of Terror. So the Reign of Terror was more than just mass murder of political dissidents and enemies of the Parisian fanatics, it was also a time of religious persecution. Any religion really, but especially Christian Catholicism, because it was so ingrained in the history of the French people. Before I get ahead of myself though, allow me to jump back once more to early December 1793. The Paris Commune was out of control and the National Convention was so weak that at this point they basically had no real power. They just did whatever the most powerful institution told them to do. But many Montagnards by December knew that if power was not kept in capable hands, then the whole program of terror might get too out of control and destroy the Republic. This was made all the more clear by the Paris Commune's vendetta against Christianity. So, in early December, the most powerful and influential delegates in Paris decided to do something to consolidate power once and for all. They passed the Law of 14 Fremer which gave executive power to the Committee of Public Safety. The centralization of power meant that France was now being led officially by the leaders of the mountain, namely Maximilien Robespierre and Louis Saint-Just. But more than anything, the ascendancy of the Committee of Public Safety was meant to end the months of unorganized governance that had taken place since the sans coulants had bullied the National Convention at the very beginning of June. So, this begs a continuation of this history. What came next with the Committee of Public Safety in full control? Well, not much actually changed for the first few months. The executions in Paris continued at their previous rates, and the armies continued to exterminate all resistance in the rest of France. Even Robespierre during early 1794 was not out of control. In fact, in fact, he and the Committee of Public Safety governed the Reign of Terror quite calmly. One might even have assumed that the Reign of Terror was about to come to an end. But in March of 1794, that all changed. The mountain was fracturing in early March with Jacques Hubert calling Camille Desmoulins an enemy of liberty, Danton arguing against the arrest of several politicians, and many more questioning the authority of Robespierre and the Committee of Public Safety. With that in mind, on March 11th, the Committee of Public Safety spoke out against this fracturing and decreed that there was a conspiracy against the Republican Revolution afoot. The decree named no names, but unsurprisingly, 20 leading politicians were arrested across Paris within days. Those arrested included Danton, Hubert, Desmoulins, and Rancin, all men that were threats to Robespierre, Saint-Just, and the agenda of the Committee of Public Safety. A Parisian named Rolt wrote on the occurrence saying, quote, The ferocity among the patriots is more savage than ever. This occurred because Danton and Desmoulins tried to halt the action of the guillotine, so now they will have to suffer it themselves. Their good intentions will be snuffed out with their lives. End quote. So it was that the arrest of the enemies of the Committee of Public Safety were put on trial on March 21st by the Paris Revolutionary Tribunal. 
All were sentenced to execution by guillotine on trumped-up charges to the cheers of the dubious citizens of Paris. They were executed in early April, and this was a momentous time because it signaled that France was completely controlled by the delegates of the Committee of Public Safety. No longer was the Paris Commune or the sans culottes the primary movers and motivators of the revolution. The historian William Doyle, in fact, wrote that it, quote, it proved to be the end of the sans culottes as a political force and the end of the Paris Commune as their independent mouthpiece, end quote. So, after these unjust executions, the Committee of Public Safety dissolved the Revolutionary Army, further evidence of their utter dominance. It was entirely possible, as I said before, that the reign of terror could have ended there. The rebellions were entirely squashed and the violence was tapering off throughout but the greatest excesses of the Reign of Terror were just about to begin. That brings me to the third and final section of this episode, the Summer Days of 1794. Beginning in late April, the Committee of Public Safety pushed the National Convention, which was now simply serving as a puppet, to push back against the previous dechristianization policies. Maximilien Robespierre was now really coming into his own because what he proposed on May 7, 1794 was not a restoration of Christianity, but rather he sought to found a new religion. Robespierre established the cult of the supreme being, in which the people were to worship the supreme being and value the virtues of liberty and detest the vices of tyranny. The inauguration of the cult was accompanied by speeches by Robespierre to the public, and the entire operation was certified by the National Convention. In retrospect, the whole idea seems like a joke, but Robespierre, I believe, this is an opinion here, was seeking to unite the people of his republic, exactly as Augustus Caesar of Rome had done with his imperial cult, which had been created to inspire loyalty and unity, and Robespierre hoped to do the same. But he wasn't a French Augustus and many in Paris were shocked by this action. A former colleague of Danton said, quote, Look at the bugger. It's not enough for him to be master. He has to be God, too. But Robespierre was deadly serious, and by the end of May, he was largely seen, ironically, as a dictator and a tyrant. In late May, several assassins tried to topple Robespierre before his tyranny grew any further, but they failed. But Robespierre got the message, though. The two assassins were promptly executed, along with 60 other apparent conspirators. Furthermore, Robespierre sought more power for the Committee of Public Safety and himself. So he oversaw the drafting of a new law, the Law of 22 Prairie. It was passed on June 10th and became known as the Law of the Great Terror. The law is so named because it expanded the authority of the revolutionary tribunals to a whole new level. Now a simple accusation could see you on trial, and the tribunals were to give you only two verdicts, acquittal or execution. As Robespierre did this, he denounced political factions once more. But the other politicians of Paris recognized that this was the same tactic that had allowed Robespierre and the Committee of Public Safety to arrest and execute Danton, de Moulins, and the Lot in late March, early April. They knew that in Robespierre's paranoia, he would try and eliminate anyone he perceived as a threat, so on June 12th, the National Convention once more granted judicial immunity to their delegates. Under this protection, leaders in June and July in Paris were able to unite themselves against Robespierre and the whole Committee of Public Safety without fear of arrest. That didn't protect the rest of Paris, however, for Robespierre drew up prescription lists for the Paris Tribunal to try as enemies of the Republic. Robespierre wanted to purge the capital or anyone he or the Committee of Public Safety thought to be a threat. And now thousands were again being put on trial, not for what they had done, but for what they might do. Thus Robespierre initiated the Great Terror in the summer of 1794. In June and July alone, nearly 3,000 Parisians lost their heads to the guillotines as a result. By far the worst time of the Reign of Terror for Paris. The execution and general mayhem in the countryside had dropped off remarkably by May, but thanks to the vicious perseverance of Robespierre, approximately another 20,000 or more lost their lives in the countryside. By mid-July, the tables were clearly turning against Robespierre, though. No longer were crowds cheering or even attending executions, and anonymous journalism portrayed him as a delusional tyrant out to kill anyone who looked at him wrong. Robespierre was very aware of this, though, and he refused to meet the National Convention and locked himself away in his deep paranoia. On July 26th, however, the terrifying man came out to address the Jacobin Club. His speech was frightening. He said that there was a, quote, conspiracy against public liberty, and he also declared that he would hunt down and eliminate these enemies. 
It was undoubtable at this point that Robespierre was a full-fledged tyrant. He had let power and fear drive him mad. He accused fellow members of the Committee of General Defense, the National Convention, and even the Committee of Public Safety itself. This proved to be Robespierre's last act, though, because his frightful words provoked his enemies and colleagues to strip him of power. But they knew that he had become too powerful, so the only course of action was to kill him. So on July 27, 1794, Robespierre was arrested along with Louis St. Just, Francois Henriot, and several others. Robespierre tried to commit suicide, but only succeeded in blasting off a portion of his jaw. So it was that Maximilien Robespierre and his followers were executed without trial on July 28th, and the reign of terror was at an end. That does it for this episode. If you liked what you heard, make sure to rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes. And next time I will be back with the conclusion of the French Revolution. Thank you very much. <laughs>